Good afternoon. I'm Eric Bierbaum, Assistant Professor of Government and Social Studies and Director of Graduate Studies at the Software Center for Ethics. And it's really my great pleasure to introduce uh, this panel entitled, Is There Moral Force to the Identified Victim Bias? Or you might put another way, Is the Identified Victim a Bias? A bias, really a bias at all. Um, and we'll start with Norm Daniels, who's Mary B. Uh, Stanton Stahl, Professor of Population Ethics and Professor of Ethics in Population Health. Um, his work ranges very broadly on justice and health, intergenerational equity, and moral epistemology. He's developing uh, the Benchmarks of Fairness Project, a system for assessing the fairness of health sector reform in developing countries. Um, next, we'll have Michael Otsuka, Professor of Philosophy at University College London. His book, Libertarianism Without Inequality, um, really set the agenda for left, left wing uh, libertarianism. And he's written about saving the greater number, irrationality of deontological constraints, um, and so much more. And finally, Professor Nir Ayel, Assistant Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He teaches in Harvard University's campus-wide program in ethics uh, in public health. Uh, he's written about such topics as healthcare rationing in resource-poor settings, uh, markets and human organs, and the ethical grounds for informed consent. So we're gonna go in that order, and we'll start with Norm. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I don't know if you've learned as much as I have over the last uh, day, day and a half, but I've found this an extremely useful set of discussions, and I hope this stimulates, this panel stimulates some further discussion. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the identified versus statistical problem. My bottom line is this, is a very modest view that most philosophers reject, which is that um, uh, I'm not quite sure how to resolve the reasonable disagreement I find in this case, and um, we perhaps need some process for doing that. Um, uh, so <coughs> um, there are some preliminaries, and some of this is obviated by the uh, discussion we've had and presentations we've had over the last couple days. So there are a lot of contexts in which this problem arises. But I wanted to draw your attention to a particular caution that Paul Menzel has given, that this distinction is often a broken back one. And by that he means that in the context of a range of cases that he uh, thinks of, like uh, medicine versus, or treatment versus prevention, or perhaps public health versus medicine, um, we don't get a very clean mapping of the identified victim problem uh, onto those problems because um, you find identified victims on both sides of the problem and you find statistical uh, cases on both sides. So it's not always obvious how one would use this contrast between identified versus statistical lives in the context of um, real world contrasts. Now, my discussion will uh, later on take off from a particular piece of work in the um, <coughs> decision science literature, a paper by uh, Jenny and George Lowenstein. Jo uh, George Lowenstein and his uh, then collaborator Deborah Small, uh, rather Deborah was on the panel yesterday afternoon, but she referred to some work, but not this particular paper, which predates her own thesis work and the work she did with George. But in this paper, one of the features of the argument was that there was uh, some social science basis for picking out as a trigger for the identified victim problem, not the vividness of the identification, and she did review some of uh, that uh, evidence, but also not the certainty and not the fact that it was ex ante versus ex post, um, uh, but rather the concentration of risk. Uh, that an identified victim faces as opposed to others. So I'm going to come back to that issue, and one could take the argument I'm going to make later as conditional. If 
this is an important factor in explaining why we're concerned about this case, or this is what triggers our concern about the identified life is really the concentration of risk the life faces, then what are the consequences of that? And could that ever be a morally relevant distinction? In their paper, Jenny and Lowenstein argue it's a gray area and it probably isn't relevant. And I want to say that uh, there might actually be some context in which it is. Um, so that's an argument I will come back to. What I want to start with is uh, a point that was touched on in several of the presentations yesterday, namely that um, if one looks at both consequentialist and non-consequentialist perspectives on this problem, or frameworks for arguing on this problem, one finds that within both uh, areas, both kinds of argument, one finds pro and con positions taken on the uh, identified versus statistical lives. And I think of this as a context in which there's a lot of uh, reasonable disagreement among philosophers. Uh, philosophers are not troubled by that. They say, well, we'll work it out in time. And uh, a piece of me is very oriented towards real world decision making and the fact that decisions have to be made in real time, not uh, philosopher's time. And um, this may mean we need some way of resolving disagreements prior to philosophers agreeing that they resolve those disagreements, which may be an ephemeral event uh, historically anyway. Um, <coughs> so uh, if one looks at the consequentialist arguments about this, I think it's not uh, unfair to divide them into two categories. Uh, the arguments against favoring identified lives generally take the form of saying uh, the consequences that we need to consider are spelled out by the description of the problem, uh, and those are all the consequences. We can uh, save this identified life or perhaps um, uh, the, there may be some other um, statistical lives that are at risk and we could save them and that's all there is to the consequences. And if one is looking at that, then might uh, follow the kind of argument that um, uh, in a lot of ways Dan Brock was suggesting yesterday that one should um, look at the empirical results in the both cases and make a decision. Um, the pro-arguments, the ones that say, well, maybe there's some room to find uh, f uh, uh, in favor of a bias in favor of identified victims, tends to say, well, the story one could tell about consequences is broader than the simple uh, sketch of conflicting lives that are at risk. Uh, one might have externalities that are in place. Uh, and they might even take the dramatic form that Alan Gibbard once described of uh, the dehumanization of some, uh, of our turning our back on identified victims. And, and uh, another possibility is that uh, this dehumanization or other features might lead to a causal connection between abandoning an identified person and failing then in the long run to save more lives because uh, that may be a consequence of the way we affect the population. So um, uh, I think of that as an important division between the two types of consequentialist views we look at. One example of a, a consequentialist argument that Charles Fried made is um, that uh, and this is in a seminal paper in 69, one of the earliest systematic discussions of the problem in the literature, and I think it was in the Harvard Law Review. Um, uh, so he imagined we could have a budget for life saving, and then they asked the question, given this budget for life saving, um, should we favor identified lives or not? And he argued for a kind of neutrality on the grounds that uh, and he put this in the mouth of the economist, perhaps to signal that his libertarian bent was not signed up with the full thrust of this argument. But um, 
Uh, so his picture was that um, we should be neutral and only go for most efficient savings of lives. Um, uh, he replied to um, a kind of symbolic value argument, he labeled it, um, which said, okay, maybe there's, if, if there was a symbolic value to saving an identified life, um, then uh, it would come at a high cost, namely the value of um, saving that life at the cost of saving fewer lives, and how could that be a consistent position within uh, this framework? Uh, he also anticipated in this article a kind of argument, he labeled it differently, but it was called personalist argument. So there might be some relationships that exist between uh, the identified victim and uh, a possible rescuer um, that um, we ought to take into account. And uh, he then argued that um, this distinction doesn't work because uh, eventually, um, the statistical lives become real, and indeed, people might not have had any uh, plausible relationships with the people who are being saved to start with. So um, that's a sketch of, an, of a kind of consequentialist argument. Uh, one thing you should notice is that if you make this kind of consequentialist argument and make the claim that all of this is a systematic error that people are making of some sort, then you need a kind of error theory that explains why do so many people make this error. And there are some in the literature. Uh, I don't want to dwell on them, but uh, I could refer you to the philosopher Shelley Kagan who talks about uh, pale versus vivid ideas, and one might adapt that contrast to try to account for this. Uh, the Kahneman-Tversky heuristics might be another form of looking for a kind of um, uh, error theory. Um, on the other branch of the consequentialist, consequentialist position would be the kinds of pro-arguments, and one of the prominent ones in the literature is uh, an argument by McKee and Richardson, which looks at the externalities um, that are generated by, um, uh, so we take a lot of pleasure in, or uh, some benefits to third parties, including rescuers in rescuing the identified life. Um, and uh, they put a lot of attention on this, but their focus is around the question of uh, the rule of rescue rather than the identified victim problem. I think they're first cousins, but let's leave that wrinkle aside. Uh, another version of this uh, pro version of the consequentialist argument is found in Alan Gibbard's work. Um, he wrote a paper um, in which he posed uh, in a somewhat skeptical way that we have, might have dehumanization and turning our backs on identified uh, lives that we're willing to walk away from rescuing. Um, and uh, he suggested that uh, that might be what motivates this problem. And if that dehumanization was a serious problem, it might lead us to want to um, uh, favor in some way that, uh, uh, identified lives. So my view is that, uh, gee, depending on how one thinks about all the consequences, the consequentialist argument divides into pro and con positions. And you might have particular views about which is more supportable version of these consequentialist arguments, but I'm uh, simply going to leave the point at saying there's a lot of disagreement about how to look at that from that perspective. If one turns instead to non-consequentialist arguments, um, the con position is fairly prominent. People talk about uh, a life is a life and we ought to save that life and not uh, disrespect it in any way and it doesn't matter whether it's statistical or identified to start with. Um, and I'm not going to go into that branch of the argument at all. Uh, the piece of the argument that I wanted to focus on is the pro-argument that might be raised from a 
uh, non-consequentialist perspective. Uh, and here I want to focus on what I mentioned earlier, namely that some of the decision science literature suggests a trigger for the process is this concern about concentration of risk. So I want to ask the question, um, could that ever be a morally relevant consideration? And could we take it into account and think that it has a bearing on what we ought to do? And that's the sense in which I think we might raise the question, is there a moral force? So um, I'm going to do something that I'm not used to doing in my own work, which is um, follow a methodology that I have some disagreements with. Um, uh, Francis's uh, intuitive exploration of, Francis Cam's intuitive exploration of cases. Um, so um, in her strategy, uh, and I'm drawing here on the chapters on nearness that uh, from her book, Intricate Ethics, um, she talks about uh, the elements of a strategy for identifying whether um, uh, something counts as a morally relevant trait. And specifically, she argues in favor of looking at fully uh, equalized cases, um, that is, where the consequences are the same. And part of uh, what I wanted to do was distinguish the identified versus statistical life problem from an aggregation problem. So one of the features that I want to do uh, in the argument that follows that I want to emphasize is that uh, I'm going to try to talk about one statistical life and one identified life and consider whether we ought to give some weight to the uh, identified life and rescuing it. Um, and I want to abstract from the way the problem is often presented, one life uh, identified life versus many statistical lives, because I think that also raises a further question about how we aggregate uh, across life saving, and I just wanted to separate that. Um, so uh, that's my strategy, and um, uh, what I want to, I will be brief in presenting this argument. Um, I know that Nir has important objections to it, and, and um, uh, Mike it's, uh, Atsuka and I were talking at lunch, and uh, we may or may not have some disagreements about how to address this, but I want to uh, talk about um, uh, an argument that might be given uh, using this strategy that Francis articulated. Um, so imagine we have, uh, with no intervention, uh, two branches of the case, one in which Alice dies for certain. Um, and the, uh, let's suppose Alice is exposed to some highly deadly illness. Um, we have to be a little fanciful to capture the flavor of Francis's cases. Um, uh, and um, I had a real struggle trying to make this uh, seem real in some way, but the, um, so Alice dies for certain, but five of her friends have been exposed to her, let's say, carrying this, to, and uh, we know that by stipulation that one of them will die as a result of this. So um, uh, um, this might be, from this we might infer that each one is at a 20% uh, stipulated risk of dying. I say stipulated because if we started with the assumption that it was 20%, then we would have a problem with all the statisticians in the room who would say, well, you know, you might not have one death, you might have some low probability of more than one or none, and we get a complication. So philosophers like to simplify the world, we'll stipulate that one dies. Um, now, we can save Alice by giving her all five pills that we have for the conditions she has. Or we could give one pill each, in a sense, as a prophylactic or uh, early treatment intervention for the other five, and um, we will protect them so that with certainty none will die. So that the 
problem is, do we save Alice for certain, who will die for certain without the intervention? But if we do give her the five pills, we can't protect the one person who will die in the statistical group. And this was my way of trying to equalize cases. So there's one expected life saved um, uh, in each case. Um, and uh, uh, so you could say that these were equalized cases. You know, maybe that's not adequate, but. Um, so here's a, um, so my picture is that if I gave, give this task to people, a certain number of people, perhaps most of you, would want to save Alice. Maybe not. Um, maybe uh, you'd want to flip a coin um, and think that they're equal cases. Um, but we can change the case a little bit, and that's what I do here. So in this case, the second case, um, we could give Alice one pill. I'm sorry, all 100 pills. We have 100 pills now. And there are 100 people who have been exposed to her. Each one has, um, uh, and one will die in either case, Alice or the one of the 100. Um, now I think if we gave this choice to people, fewer people would flip a coin and more people would save Alice. And so what that suggests to me is that the concentration of risk matters. And you might say one in five is pretty high and I want to protect everybody, but one in a hundred, well, take your chances. Um, okay, so in the distribution of this, the argument, is, the argument I would make in favor of saving the identified life is that Alice has in this instance um, uh, a worse state than any of the five or the 100, uh, for that matter, um, in that she is uh, for sure going to die. She's worse off than people who face a one in five chance of dying or a one in 100 chance of dying. And it's because she's worse off that we might justify saving her life. Uh, the problem is um, I, I appeal to Alice's really being worse off in this case, but we could modify the case and then we come to some of the other kinds of cases that Mike, Michael will take up and uh, near as well. Uh, suppose one of the five friends, um, let's say Betty uh, in the example, uh, turns out to be the only one truly with a risk of dying, let's say, her genetic composition is such that the course of the disease will lead to her dying, but the others won't. So um, she is equally worse off on this view uh, to, uh, as Alice is. Uh, and my rationale for favoring Alice over her disappears if this is true. Um, so on the other hand, we don't have a way to test which of those five has this? And one question you could ask is whether the subjective uncertainty about which of the five uh, would justify um, still saving Alice, uh, since I now, as the allocator in this situation, don't know which of the five uh, has the uh, genes and maybe can't test for it, unless no responsibility for finding out and there's no possibility of finding out. Um, so uh, the question is, what do we do? Now, some people in this case will want to flip a coin because the argument completely disappears about being worse off. Uh, my own perspective on this is that we should accept the uh, uh, epistemic subject, uh, subjectively epistemic uh, uh, probability that the one in f we don't know which of the five will die, and this is unfortunate, but nevertheless, uh, it's not unfair to Betty to favor Alice in this case. That's my inclination. You may disagree, and we may find some arguments against that. So that's my uh, uh, conclusion. I know Nir will go on to argue that uh, wrong in this case and we should um, 
uh, fairness doesn't apply to chances. So I was arguing before that um, uh, Alice was worse off than the others, and that was her chance of dying, uh, and that's not an adequate ground. But uh, I'll leave that for Nir to present the argument. And there are many other examples that would support the kind of focus on concentration of risk. Uh, Francis suggested to me that, um, okay, if we had a construction project that would lead to one in four dying, and we only needed four builders for the project, we would probably avoid doing it because the concentration of risk was too great. But if we could, uh, if it took a thousand construction workers to build this project, we often gamble on their lives in this way and uh, walk away from that problem, even if we could be sure that if one would die. Um, so her, her view was that uh, this was a per persuasive example of uh, how this is a more generalizable argument. But I want to emphasize in conclusion that this is a limited result. It doesn't apply to aggregation. I haven't said anything about how strong this preference is, and I don't want to extrapolate from that. Uh, I also am a little worried about my appeal to the epistemic uncertainty in the, um, uh, the variation on the example I gave. And if the being worse off is not the deciding feature, then we do need another account, and I don't have a well-developed account of that. Um, the, I won't go into, uh, because of time, the uh, conclusion that I come to, which is that uh, there is reasonable disagreement about what to do about these cases, and we need a kind of fair, deliberative process for resolving the disagreements that show up at the policy level um, when we face these kinds of trade-offs uh, between identified and statistical lives. And um, uh, there are problems with appealing to this process in this context, namely, it doesn't guarantee fairness over time, and second, uh, it may be fairly difficult to apply it, given that these decisions take place at many different levels in society. So uh, let me stop with that. I should begin my exploration with a case involving an identified victim, then I'll eventually take us to some cases involving what are known as anonymous victims, and then eventually to a case involving a statistical death. Okay, well, suppose that a comet carrying a pathogen has landed in a cornfield near the town of Springfield in an unnamed state in the Midwest. Okay, now the government comes to realize that it's faced with the following three choices. Choice number one, do nothing, in which case a plague will kill 100,000 people who live within a 500-mile radius of this cornfield in the Midwest. Now, this isn't a terribly realistic case, and my subsequent cases are going to become even less realistic. Now, if you object, well, would you have rather that this actually had happened? I mean, would you rather this be a real case? Second thing is Martha Nussbaum has advocated that it may even be better to uh, take cases from fiction, given the sort of richness of the fictional world. Well, I mean, this case is taken from a very rich work of fiction, namely The Simpsons, I think several episodes. So at least I've satisfied that one desiderato. Okay, right, so the government is faced with some choices. If it does nothing about this comet that's hurling towards Springfield, it will release a plague which will kill 100,000 people within a 500-mile radius of Springfield. Okay. Second option, I call the second option known limb Bob. Now you'll notice the very high mortality rate of people with names that begin Alice, Betty, Bob. I mean, it's an unfortunate consequence of these examples. 
If I'd known, I would have given him the name Zach, although there's no, well, actually, um, it'd be hard pressed to come with a city that starts with the letter Z as well, but um, second option is prevent the plague, but at the foreseen and unintended cost of one person's limb, it's already known who this person is. His name is Bob, he lives in Boca Raton, Florida. Okay, just to make it vivid, this isn't obviously Florida and this isn't Bob, but this is just to make vivid the fact that he's got his arm at stake. Okay, that's the, 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 the second thing the government can do. Third thing the government can do is called what I call unknown life dust, and this involves an anonymous death, which is taking steps that would be equally effective in preventing the plague, but at the foreseen and unintended cost of another person's life. It's not known in advance who this person is. All that's known is that he's someone who resides in California, population 40 million. Moreover, let us stipulate that his death would be causally necessitated by the measures taken under this policy to combat the pathogen, and that the death of anyone else is actually causally impossible. So we might imagine something like the following. We might imagine that these, these particular measures that the government could take to defuse this plague would result in the release of a cloud of rare and exotic particles of dust that would descend on California leaving everyone completely unaffected except for this one person whose unique genetic constitution dooms him to a fatal adverse reaction to these particles. In other words, in this case, it's objectively determined but not known which person would die if the government pursues policy number three. So when we consider their epistemic risks, by which I mean those risks that were justified in believing to be the case, given the evidence available to us, each Californian would be exposed to an equal and very small one in 40 million chance of being killed by option number three. Now, let me just note that one couldn't justify subjecting Californians to this slight risk of death or subjecting Bob and Boca Raton to a certainty of harm short of death on grounds that this would be better for them, the Californians or Bob, than doing nothing. So leaving aside any self-regarding interests peace people in Florida or California might have for the fate of Midwesterners, they might just regard it as flyover country. Suppose they have no self-interested interest in Midwestern. Midwestern it's exactly, yeah. so, so, right. so I mean, assume that you all just think it's flyover country, right? Which is, I suppose, what, what I hear people on the East Coast and the West Coast say about the Midwest. Um, so, so they have no self-interested uh, concern from these Midwesterners, so it's not in Bob's interest at any point in time. Actually, we might say if we step back, um, it, you know, we could say it is in uh, their interest, but, but uh, I'll just park that thought for the moment. But given where we are now, we know that this, this comet has you know, landed in the Midwest, and there are three options, do nothing, do that which will result in Bob's losing an arm, do that which will result in one Californian dying. So neither in, at this point, Bob's or the Californian's interest to um, save the Midwesterners in either the second or the third way. But it's nevertheless clear, even though such a justification is in either Bob or the Californian's ex ante, interests can't be presented, that the government must do something. It can't simply do nothing and let 100,000 people, even from the Midwest, die. So many lives would be lost if the government did nothing. And these lives could be saved at such a relatively small cost to others, right? So we remove doing nothing from the agenda. So we want to focus now on our options two and options three. Well, what about these remaining two options? That which will certainly result in Bob and Boca Raton losing a, a limb, or that which will result in our unknown Californian losing a life. Well, suppose that we decided that what we should do is straightforwardly discount people's harms by their known improbability, where we simply multiply the magnitude of a harm someone would suffer by the known probability of his suffering it, right? Well, it would follow that none of the residents of California would have a complaint that's as great as the complaint of Bob and Boca Raton. That's because each Californian's complaint against dying as a result of this third policy would be sharply discounted by the one in 40 million chance of death. Now, of course, premature death is undoubtedly worse than losing a limb, but it's not 40 million times worse than losing a limb. 
I mean, it would, after all, be rational for a person to expose himself to a far higher than one in 40 million risk of losing a limb in order to, uh, of losing his life in order to save a limb for certain that he would otherwise lose. Okay, so even if one acknowledges that each Californian's probability discounted complaint against losing a life is much smaller than Bob's undiscounted complaint against losing a limb, perhaps one could argue that the government should nevertheless choose to sacrifice Bob's limb, which I assume most people would say the government should do, over sending this cloud of dust over California for the following reason. Even though each Californian's complaint is very small because so heavily discounted, when these 40 million very small complaints are gathered together and aggregated, they collectively outweigh the complaint of Bob in Boca Raton. Maybe that's why we should sacrifice Bob rather than the Californians, because even though their complaints are individually very small, collectively they outweigh Bob's complaint. Well, I think one ought to hesitate before aggregating complaints in this manner. Such aggregation, I think, involves the wrong rationale for choosing to sacrifice Bob in this case. It seems either to appeal to a morally trivial consideration, or else it appears to be superfluous, as I'll explain. Now, um, the, here's, here, here's what I want to um, say. Once the complaints have been so heavily discounted, each Californian's complaint actually seems rather trivial. It's a complaint against subjection to a minuscule increase in one's risk of premature death, which is no greater than various risks of premature death we accept as a matter of course in exchange for small conveniences. And this reminds me of the, the cell phone case. But I'm actually going to present another case, which is less realistic. Now, the complaints of the Californians might be regarded as so trivial as to be morally irrelevant when compared to a serious complaint, such as Bob's complaint against losing an arm. So we wouldn't, for example, to take another example, Scanlon's example, want to allow the mere annoyance of millions over missing 15 minutes of a World Cup match to outweigh the claim of one person in the television transmitter room to be spared the suffering of extremely painful electrical shocks. Now, this people tends to move people in the United States more than people in Europe, say, for some, <laughs> some reason. Now, moreover... That's why your lives are worth less. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Moreover, um, a person might well prefer a very slight 1 in 40 million increase in his odds of premature death to a certainty of 15 minutes of annoyance and frustration from an inter interrupted World Cup broadcast. I mean, suppose, for example, that our World Cup viewers each knew that shouting at his blank television screen would cause his set to resume broadcasting, even though he also knew that such shouting would very, very slightly increase his existing risk of a fatal heart attack by 1 in 40 million, as it very well might. This is actually the one realistic example I have. Um, well, I very much doubt that this particular health warning, you know, if you shout at your television set to resume this World Cup broadcast, and your chance of a heart attack, fatal heart attack, will go up by 1 in 40 million, would deter people from shouting at their television sets, and they may be rational not to be deterred. Now, there is, to be sure, the following important difference between Scanlon's World Cup case and my own example of Californians who would be placed at risk by being put under this cloud of dust. In my case of Californians at risk, the trivially low risks of death shared by millions combines into something very far from trivial. It adds up to the certainty of one person's death. And by contrast, millions of viewers experiencing annoyance and frustration over an interrupted World Cup match doesn't add up to any serious harm to anyone. I mean, there's no social entity who suffers the annoyance of you know, millions of people but this difference between Scanlon's World Cup case and my case of Californians placed under risk by being put under this cloud of desk, the dust, I think, reveals that it's superfluous to aggregate the individually minor complaints of the many Californians. Rather, I think it's sufficient in this case of Californians merely to appeal to the strength of the non-discounted complaint of the one Californian who we know would die. And that's why we should choose to sacrifice Bob's limb over the life of the Californian. Now, if we opt for the third option, placing this cloud of dust over, over California, one particular Californian with this unique genetic constitution is certain to die. This particular individual, we don't know who he is, has a 100% objective certainty of death. Now, throughout this talk, 
what I shall mean by objective probabilities is, in Matt Adler's words, frequencies relative to classes of persons and events that in fact share all the same causally relevant features, not merely the features about which good statistical data is actually available. Well, one causally relevant feature is whether you have the unique genetic constitution that renders you vulnerable to this cloud of dust. Now, Matt contrasts such objective probabilities, he actually calls them physical probabilities, with what he calls statistical probability, what I'll call epistemic probability, which is defined as frequencies relative to classes of events and persons about which statistical data is actually available. Okay. Uh, sorry. Um, now, this one Californian um, shares the same objective 100% chance of being harmed under policy three that Bob in Boca Raton has of being harmed under policy two. Given that they each share an objective certainty of being harmed under the respective policies, shouldn't we simply compare the magnitude of the two harms, premature death for the Californian versus the loss of a limb for Bob in Boca Raton, without discounting any Californian's complaint by its epistemic improbability? And I think we should do at this point is pause to ask ourselves why it is that our Californian with the unique genetic constitution, who is therefore fated to die, nevertheless shares the same epistemic and very low one in 40 million risk of dying as every other Californian. Well, the answer to this question is it's simply on account of our inability to pick this unfortunate individual out of a crowd of 40 million Californians. This shared low epistemic probability of dying, I think, is morally irrelevant given the apparent unreality of these merely epistemic risks that he shares with every other Californian. I mean, we ask the following question, well, why should our inability due to ignorance to pick this person out of a large crowd, in contrast with our ability to single out and identify Bob and Boca Raton, make such a big difference to the strength of their claims against being harmed? So it seems right that we assign this unknown Californian a non-discounted 100% complaint against death, just as we assign Bob and Boca Raton a non-discounted 100% complaint against losing his limb. Here it appears that we should assign our unknown Californian a complaint that tracks his 100% objective risk of death, rather than one that tracks his merely epistemic 1 in 40 million risk of death. And once we do so, our choice now boils down to the following. Imposing loss of a limb on one person under known limb, or imposing loss of a life on another person in the case of unknown life dust. And once things have been appropriately framed in this manner, it becomes clear that we should spare a life rather than a limb, and therefore we should choose to sacrifice Bob's limb. Now in arguing that we shouldn't discount our unknown Californian's complaint by its epistemic improbability, what I've been appealing to is the apparent greater significance of, obje of objective rather than epistemic improbabilities when the two come apart, as they do in the dust case. But what should we say about cases in which epistemic and objective probabilities actually come together? They coincide rather than coming apart. Well, let's now consider the following contrasting case involving uh, what I call unknown life wheel, in which once again it's certain that precisely one Californian would die, yet he and everyone else has an objective and not merely an epistemic one in 40 million chance of dying. Well, let's stipulate the following. Let's stipulate that in this case, unknown life wheel, the governments neutralizing the plague would have the following foreseen but unintended consequence. Each person would be exposed to a risk which insofar as the causal nature of the risk is concerned is equivalent to the following scenario that I invite you to imagine. As a result of natural processes, a large ball receives a hard but indeterministic push that causes it to spin around and around a very large roulette wheel in the sky that contains, let's imagine, 40 million slots. Each slot is connected to a chute that leads to the head of a unique Californian. Now we know that the ball is eventually going to travel down one of these 40 million chutes aimed at one of 40 million Californians, thereby killing that person to which it leads. Now here, each Californian has an objective 
as well as an epistemic 1 in 40 million chance of dying. It isn't deterministically faded in advance that any particular Californian would die under this policy. It is, however, known in advance that precisely one Californian would die. Now, unlike the case of unknown life dust, in this case of unknown life wheel, it's not simply due to our ignorance as to which one of the 40 million Californians would be killed that we assign each of them a one in 40 million chance of premature death. Rather, this reflects a genuine objective risk that each of them would share to precisely the same degree that of being hit by a roulette ball coming out of the sky. Each Californian is placed at risk by being underneath this roulette wheel in the sky. By contrast, no Californian is placed at any genuine risk simply by being part of the crowd into which the one man with the unique genetic constitution has been lost. The one in 40 million odds of dying a premature death that we assign to each in the dust case reflects just our lack of information about the way the world really is rather than any exposure to dangers that the world presents to each of us. Now, it might be sensible to conclude on the basis of these differences that we possess good reason in our wheel case and that good reason is lacking in our dust case to take seriously the one in 40 million risks that each Californian has in these respective cases of suffering premature death. Well, this isn't enough, however, to establish that complaints against death in the wheel case should track nothing other than the genuine risk, i.e., I don't think that anything I've said establishes that we should sharply discount every Californian's complaint by the very low, you know, real objective risk of his suffering death in the wheel case. Though I've offered grounds to assign each Californian in the wheel case a complaint against premature death that's discounted by its one in 40 million chance of coming about, I've not also offered any reason to exclude the following further, and I think much more significant complaint that every Californian, that, that, that um, a single Californian has in the wheel case, just like the dust case. There is one Californian who would be killed for certain by the falling roulette ball in the wheel case. And I want to suggest that he has a non-discounted complaint, a 100% case complaint against being killed. Now, you might wonder at this point, if we take account of this one Californian, we don't know who he is, it's not even determined who he would be, we take account his complaint against being killed while also taking account of every Californian's complaint against being subjected to an objective risk of being killed, might, be we, might we be accused of double counting? Well, I don't think this particular accusation of double counting is force. And this is because it's morally objectionable both to be killed and to be subjected to an objective risk of being killed, even if that objective risk doesn't result in any tangible physical harm. You have a complaint, for example, against having Russian roulette played on you, even if this doesn't result in your being killed. If, moreover, you're killed as a result of having Russian roulette played on you, then you have a distinct and, I think, a far more serious complaint. I think the following is the most morally significant fact about our wheel case. Even though anyone who's killed by the falling roulette ball has a very low 1 in 40 million objective probability of being killed, there is, under this policy, an objective 100% certainty that someone, and moreover that precisely one person, would be killed by the falling roulette ball. And what I want to propose is that what explains why we should not discount the complaint against being killed of our unknown Californian in the wheel case is the fact that there is, in the wheel case, as in the dust case, an objective 100% certainty that someone would be killed. I think it's that objective 100% certainty that grounds the, the claim that the complaint of the person who would be killed by the falling roulette ball should not be discounted. Okay, so um, how much time have you been? Um, shall I go on for uh, five minutes? Okay, well, I, I might, um, I'll try to stick to, to five minutes. But um, So um, now what I want to do is, is, is take some stock and, and, and l l ask the following question. Well, what if we were actually confronted? Uh, so, confronted with simply the following contrast. Uh, there's this, um, once again, this comet that will kill 100,000 Midwesterners, unless now um, we can imagine you either um, send the dust cloud over California or you put the roulette wheel over California. Okay. Now, I just want to draw some contrast among these three cases. Now, in Bob, Dust, and Wheel, there's a 100% objective chance that one person will be harmed. But in Bob, 
the harm is less great than in dust and in wheel. It's also known who will be harmed in the Bob case. Now in dust, each person has the same low epistemic risk of being harmed by the dust, but only one unknown person has any objective risk of being harmed. And in wheel, each person has the same low epistemic and objective risk of being killed by the roulette ball. So now I'm asking you, suppose that now dust and wheel were our only plague-averting options and sacrificing Bob's arm is unfortunately no longer on the table. Now there's a respect, there's a respect in which wheel would be preferable to dust. It would be preferable to dust insofar as the objective risks we spread more evenly and in more egalitarian fashion in the wheel case, right? In the wheel cases, all which share a low objective risk, a one in 40 million objective risk of dying, rather than objective risks being concentrated in one person. But I don't think this advantage is actually that significant because I don't think we would prefer wheel to a version of dust in which the one would become a quadriplegic rather than dying, right? I mean, if we know that in the dust case, the one would become a quadriplegic, then we would go for dust even though the risks are concentrated on the one person rather than spread risks in egalitarian fashion over 40 million people if we know that the, the, the person who's gonna die is actually gonna um, suffer a worse fate than the person who become a quadriplegic. Now, though I've just mentioned that there's an egalitarian advantage to the equal spreading of risks of harm, there's also the following disadvantage when the known risks are not low, the fear that this is, induces in the people who aren't harmed. Well, if your known risk of being harmed is one in 40 million, that's not such a big deal. But suppose that instead of doing that, which would certainly result in Bob's losing his arm, one could do that which would expose each of Bill and Ben, once again, these poor people near the front of the alphabet, to a known 50% chance of losing his arm. Now, in this case, you might say, well, don't spread the risks out sort of evenly between these two people because it's a horrible thing for each of these two people to have the fear of a 50% chance of losing his arm. Well, if the, the risks are spread out thinly enough, then maybe it's not such a big deal. But there's some case to be made against uh, spreading out risks in terms of the, the, the fear that you spread um, out. Okay, well, um, I finally want to get to our case of the statistical death, um, so I suppose I'll press on a little bit if that's all right. Okay. Um, does it make a difference whether or not we're certain that someone or one person will be harmed or whether we're certain how many people will be harmed? Okay. Now, here's a case which I call unknown number of lives guns. Okay. Now, basically, in this case, we finally move from uh, what, what are known as anonymous deaths to statistical deaths. In the case of an anonymous death, we know exactly how many people, in cases involving anonymous deaths, we know exactly how many people will die, but we just don't know their names, hence anonymous deaths. Okay. Now I want to move to statistical deaths, where we just know the chance, say, of a single person or some number of people dying, but we don't know for sure that that um, number of people will die. So let's suppose that now each Californian has a 1 in 40 million merely statistical chance of dying. Okay. And here's an illustration of that. We can imagine um, 40 million games of Russian roulette played on 40 million different Californians, where each of these barrels has um, 40 million uh, chambers and one bullet in each of the chambers, and each chamber is spun. So each Californian, another way of thinking about it is that basically each Californian has his own Russian roulette wheel, uh, uh, roulette wheel over his head. Um, and so each of them is subjected to an object of 1 in 40 million chance of dying. But, um, these chances are independent of, of one another. In fact, there's some chance that none of them will die. I think it's about a one in three chance that none of them will die. There's some vanishingly small chance that all of them will die. Okay, now, I, I suppose I, um, I just want to um, proceed a bit quickly now because um, I've um, been running over time a bit. But what I want to say here is I don't think there's any good reason to treat this case, the case of uh, unknown life guns differently from the case involving the roulette wheel where there's a certainty. Okay. Now, basically the, the principle that I want to appeal to is what's known as a numbers neutrality claim, which is the moral significance of the difference between n versus n plus one individual suffering harm is the same for any whole number n, including the number zero. Now, there is a response to this um, which is what I call completely neutrally the Stalinist objection to numbers neutrality, which is to say there's a special significance of the fact that nobody as opposed to somebody will suffer a given harm 
as a result of the given risky policy. So these Stalinists placed a special significance on the fact that in the guns case, there's a possibility that no one will die, okay? Um, whereas in the wheel case, we know that precisely one person will die, okay? Now, um, the, the response I have is, well, first of all, yes, of course, th there's this possibility, this good outcome in which no one will die. But the flip side of that, of course, is the possibility that more than one person will die. And since on average, in these guns cases, one person dies, we might think that the chance that more than one will die pretty much morally balances out the chance that less than one will die. And regarding you know, saying, well, look, but at least we can make it the case that no one dies in this case, well, I think it's a bit artificial because it's against you know, a background in which all sorts of other people have, have died of, of risky activities, maybe even the very same sort of risky activity in the past. So that makes it, it's just, you know, basically you're just sim simply saying there's a chance that no additional person will die rather than a chance that no one will die of risky activities. And I don't think that's a very compelling reason to reject the numbers neutrality claim. So I'll just, I'll just wrap up now. Thanks. So we mentioned uh, on several occasions this case. Uh, here's, here's the general form. Um, you are allocating, say, a liver lobe. You have just one between two equally needy patients. And what do you do? Do you hand it to Alex? Or do you have a lottery between Alex and Bob? Our intuitions are there is something to be said for running the lottery. I would say the intuitions are there even if um, there is some price to be um, paid for that. For example, to run the lottery properly, we need an accountant around, and so you'll need to keep both patients around uh, for a few hours uh, till the accountant arrives. Still, there is a lot to be said for the lottery, um, and we need to explain that. We also want to explain why a given distribution of, say, life years, uh, other goods uh, in a given population seems to us to be better, fairer, when it doesn't have a social gradient, when it's not the case that some minority group is overrepresented among the ones who are worse off with respect to that good. This doesn't seem, in either case, a matter of better outcomes, because in terms of the outcomes, one patient will get the liver lobe and one will not. It's unequal, but it's equally unequal whether it comes from the lottery or the arbitrary handing to Alex. And in the other case, there is the same distribution of the good in the population. It's just a matter of you know equal numbers of people will be badly off or well off, worse off, better off. But it's a matter of whether some population is especially exposed to the risk, if you will, of being among the worse off. We want to explain those uh, feelings that we have. And one way to explain them is what I should call the fair chance thesis. It says that a distribution, can you see all that or not quite? Not very well. Hmm. <laughs> um, Really? Okay. Maybe I can ask people to come kind of, I assume that it's easier in the kind of uh, first floor? All right. Good. All right. If you want to also be able to rely on this, uh, definitely do come uh, to the first rows. So you've had access. All right. So um, what do we? Is that me or? Sorry? Yeah. Right. So according to the, to the fair chances view that says some distribution of good or bad chances is part of fairness, a determinant of fairness is what's happening in the space of chances, how you distribute chances. The view is open to the suggestion that that's the on, not the only determinant of fairness, that, for example, what you do with the outcomes. Are the outcomes at the end of the day one zero or half and half? That also matters. But the view claims that part of what matters, very minimal view, part of what matters is the distribution of chances. And 
it helps to explain why, for example, we got the intuitions that we did about the two cases that we've mentioned. Um, having a lottery gave Bob a 50% chance to getting the liver lobe, so Bob had an equal chance of living, and the view says that's important, that also matters. And in an example, for example, I'll, I'll give you a fact from the US uh, up to date to 2007, among five children, five to 14 years old, the chance of an African-American child to uh, die uh, during the coming year is, there are 21 cases on average um, among 100,000. Among non-Hispanic whites, it's 14.1. 14 so one half times greater risk among African-Americans to die. That seems unfair, and not just in so far as it suggests that we could have done more to decrease risk of death in certain populations. It's also a matter of that simply the disproportionate concentration of African Americans in that population. Um, <laughs> What I'm going to do today about this very attractive view, which has a lot of implications both for the discussion of identified persons versus statistical persons, and in many other areas of decision making, if you think about, we mentioned prevention and treatment, but also, say, reserving some resources for development of uh, drugs for rare diseases, um, and in other areas. I'm going to say about that view that actually it's false. So what I'm going to do from now on, we're going to have a, a move of arguing why, in as much as this view is very appealing, when we think of certain cases, it's just not sustainable. We should abandon it. We should say that fairness may apply in a variety of areas, but not in the distribution of chances, the currency of chance is not a currency that allows us to uh, discuss fairness and unfairness. Let me just, I, I hear kind of feedback and I don't know wh what is better, if I talk this way or if I talk here towards the microphones? Okay. So, to repeat, we can discuss the currency of distributive justice as opposed to the pattern. The pattern is whether you distribute things in equality according to priority to the worse off, you just try to maximize things. And the question still arises, what do you distribute? Whether it's things like utiles or expected utiles and things like that. I'm going to say the expected stuff, the chances, is not an appropriate currency. That leaves open the possibility that for a variety of policy reasons, indirect effects, instrumental reasons, maybe some consequentialist considerations, it will often, always, almost always, be a better policy to go for a lottery system rather than to hand it to somebody. I'm open to that possibility. <coughs> What I will argue is that to do so doesn't have the intrinsic worth of fairness that we feel, I acknowledge we do have that feeling when we think, say, about the case of the liver, liver lobe. The challenge uh, takes uh, basically the form of, of uh, some of the uh, distinctions that we've heard so far between objective and subjective chances. So what I do is to challenge the opponent to say, when you say, I want fair chances, I want a fair distribution of chances, what exactly do you mean? Because, as we have heard, there are different senses uh, to probabilistic terms like chance and prospect and expectancy. They could mean objective things and subjective things. And um, I'll give you two examples to illustrate what I have in mind, which I think is a little different, so that's a warning, a little different than um, the way that Mike carved out what he called objective and subjective. So here are two examples, one given by Laplace. He says, if there is a coin that you take to be even, 
you'll probably think that you're giving a 50% chance to heads. But in fact, turns out the coin is not even. It's uneven. Then there is a certain sense in which heads has 50%, as in, in your eyes, it has 50%. And there's a certain sense in which it doesn't, because the coin is uneven. Similarly, think about the disparities between black children and uh, white, non-Hispanic children in the US. Suppose we had no clue about statistics and epidemiology, and we had no clue about all of this. Still, there would be a sense in which the disparity exists. There is this still objectively overrepresentation of black kids among those who will die next year, and a sense in which, you know, because we don't have any clue about it, from our point of view, subjectively, epistemically, and so far as we know, we don't know anything about this, in my example. So there is um, not the not 50-50 chance. Um, objective probability is a very complex issue. There are different senses. Mike, I think, talked about objective probability in a sense in which even a coin flip in a deterministic world is already determined one way or the other. So there is not in a regular coin flip, in what we call an even coin, a 50% chance. For Mike, maybe on his criteria of objectivity, even a coin flip in a deterministic world will count as 100% for one of the two results. We just don't know it. It's a subjective matter for Mike. I just called it objective, so beware of that. For Mike, what you need is really indeterminacy in the world, some sort of special quantum coin. I think that this complication will not uh, be a big one because um, the arguments, my, what I'm going to do is I'm going to argue that fair chances doesn't hold water on objective interpretation and then that fair chances doesn't hold water on a subjective interpretation. And my arguments about the objective interpretations, at least some of them seem to work across these sub-interpretations of objectivity. And in any case, no matter what you call it, at the, by the end of the talk I'll try to have covered some, all of these different major interpretations of probabilistic terms. So, let's start with objective chances. Um, we mentioned this factoid, one half greater chance of dying um, among African American kids aged five to 14 in the US uh, in recent years. That seems to be unfair. We wanna say so, and we wanna say so, I think, thank you. Does that help? No. <laughs> okay, good, all right. So I think that the intuition that we had, and that's why it's so challenging for somebody like me who doesn't believe in the relevance of distribution of chances to fairness, the intuition wasn't that it's just unfair towards the kids who will end up dead with the worst outcomes. The intuition was exactly that it's just unfair towards a broader group, presumably because of the distribution of chance, of risk. But let's see whether that intuition is uh, one that um, we can hold on upon reflection. Try to think, who exactly are you saying this unfairness is toward? Who are those individuals who are treated wrongly here? by that um, distribution of risk. And I should add, I mentioned that earlier today, that people who focus on the distribution of risk and chance as um, part of what fairness demands are very much into uh, the idea that our obligations of fairness are not obligations towards making the world a fair place in general, but they are individualistic. You can, um, these are, uh, in the, obligations which are second personal towards people separately. Who are these individuals who are uh, treated unfairly when some, um, you, you get these data? Well, the first thought you might have had would be all African American kids who are at elevated risk, but not all African American uh, kids, five to 14 in the US in 2007, are at elevated risk. 
Kids are more than just black or white. They are also many other factors, uh, many other characteristics. They may be rich. They may have uh, a genetic propensity to have some disease. They may have a genetic propensity to like ice cream. They may have, there are many, many, many features characterizing every child. And some of the kids who are at risk quay African American are not at risk overall because say these kids are rich and in America, if you're rich, that actually promotes your chances of surviving next year. You might think the kids who have all, want to take everything affecting every kid, the kids who want to take all the features that kids have, um, the kids who, um, given all that, are at high risk. But of course, when you take everything into account, when you're talking about what Matt Adler calls physical probability, you take every factor, every risk factor into account, in a deterministic world at least, what you get is something that is coextensive with the outcomes. All the risk together in a deterministic world determine that the kid will die, determine that the kid will not die. So it's not gonna be at all separate from what we mean by outcomes, and if you're not um, um, happy with um, focusing on the latter, you want to take more into account, I don't see what is gained by focusing also on risks. In an indeterministic world, so long as it's only slightly indeterministic, we're still talking about something close to 100 and zero, so I think that doesn't get the opponent what they need. Um, you might at that point say, oh, we'll focus only on those risks we know, but that, whatever you may think about this possibility, makes you not focus anymore on objective risk. We are now talking about what we know, risks relative to our knowledge, is what we call subjective probability, epistemic probability, epistemic risk. And we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes. So um, I'm inclined to say that's one reason that the notion of chance relevant for fairness just can't be this uh, objective notion. And it sounds like um, Norm uh, concurs with that, and Mike seems to believe that there is some truth to it, but, but that the bulk of the work is done by the subjective uh, notion. Well, um, let's move to another argument against focus on objective risk. Somebody's really, really trying hard to be fair. So they, they're deliver, um, they decide how to allocate the liver lobe, with a special expensive quantum coin that they believe is very, very unbiased. And you know, it's, it's not even determinate. It's as objective as can be. And then they flip the coin, they cover it, and just before they reveal the results and see who will get the liver lobe, they hear somebody screaming, stop! In comes the manager of the coin mint, uh, and the manager says, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. You know, there was a machine error. Oh, um, thank goodness I'm here on time. You're about to do something so, so unfair. The, the, I know that you didn't know that, but the coin is very uneven. In fact, it's 90% against one of the two people here, and uh, only 10% uh, chance that they will get it. The other person is, is nearly certain to get the, the liver lobe. And uh, sure, okay, thank God that I got, okay, let's go together to the mint and we'll get you an, a new coin and we'll do it properly. Where's the mint? Uh, it's in Western Mass, but you know, don't, don't worry about it. It will take us just a few hours and uh, there's a small cost. I mean, it's 90, 10, very unfair and we're talking about life and death. Surely if fairness and the distribution of objective chance matters at all, surely the three of you will join me, we'll go to the coin, we'll do it properly. I think it makes perfect sense for the three of you to say, you know, sir, actually, we don't know who it's biased against, and that's good enough for us. We are behind a, what John Rawls called a thin veil of ignorance. It's fine procedurally. Maybe it doesn't satisfy people who are not satisfied with John Rawls's thin veil of ignorance's unequal outcomes, but insofar as one cares about the procedures and all that, good enough for us, thank you, no problem. That again suggests to me that, um, oh, so this is asking the question and if you agree um, and audiences uh, 
ever seem to agree. There is always this um, one person in the audience who says, no, it's still unfair. But um, a lot of people agree. It seems that objective chances don't matter much. Let's move quickly to subjective interpretations. And these, of course, um, can be of two kinds. I'm going to start with looking quickly at the claimant's point of view, what, is, what they know um, and the risk relative to what their knowledge, and then move to the allocator's viewpoint. So you might think that what we should really focus on is what the claimants know, so long as they have hope so long as they would want to participate in this. Um, they can't really complain in retrospect if things worked out against them. And that's why it's so, so important from the point of view of fairness that we give them a chance. But the chance here we understand as they perceive it. But that seems to me not to work well uh, because of this example. The claimants in this example don't know that the coin is loaded. In fact, the allocator knows that the coin is loaded, they exploit it, and as a result, one of the persons uh, didn't, in some important sense, I think, insofar as you want to buy into this talk about the importance of fair chances, didn't get a fair chance. So if we want to do the procedural fairness talk, if we want to buy into that um, world of intuitions, I think this one is not really an appealing um, possibility. We shouldn't focus on um, fair chances as assessed from the point of view of the two uh, candidates for the award. What we should focus on instead is um, on the allocator's viewpoint. That's the last resort that the people who defend fair chances have. And now I'll argue that even that one doesn't work. So on the whole, fair chances just doesn't work. So um, two arguments against um, the focus on the allocator's point of view. I should add the appealing thing about the allocator's point of view is that a lot of people say morality is all about having a certain attitude and acting and choosing with a certain attitude towards each and every individual. And it seems to them that if you distribute the liver lobe, say, with a lottery rather than to hand it to Alex, you show more, con more equal concern towards the two people. If you hand it to your friend Alex and not at all give any chance to the other person, then it would show unequal concern. But think about whether at least the account in terms of unequal concern is sustainable. Think about an allocator who is publicly known to be very, very committed to patients of disease X. In fact, he is one of them. In fact, he's a longtime activist for them. And um, everybody knows that. There is no suspicion whatsoever that he has less than equal concern for patients who have disease X. In this story, this allocator decides um, to allocate uh, goods on the basis of cost-effectiveness analysis, which counts against active patients of disease X. Why? Because, for example, we're talking about a treatment versus prevention kind of dilemma. The active patients need expensive treatment. The allocator decides instead to focus on prevention of, say, that disease, which will save more lives, but doesn't give any chance to the people who already have the disease. So they acted against giving chance to an identified, to a group of identified people. But what should we say about this person? I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say this allocator inevitably acted out of unequal concern. Nor does it make sense to say this allocator wasn't careful enough. They didn't, George Shear says, uh, it's not exactly that it express, shows that you had a unequal concern, but it doesn't give you enough assurance that you were acting not out of unequal concern. But in this case, person's case, we really don't need that assurance. He's well known, and everybody wouldn't suspect that they um, act out of unequal concern. So um, that consideration is not relevant. And several other ways to cash out the worry about unequal concern, I think, fail in this case. So, whoops. So 
I just want to say, at least the account in terms of unequal concern fails for this person. I'll quickly run through one final, exa one final example, and that would be it. Um, in this example, we have an allocator who, in designing a waiting list for liver lobes, systematically prioritizes those patients whom this allocator knows about. He knows about these cases, and then they get a little boost in the waiting list. That doesn't seem a paradigm of fairness and distribution, doesn't it? But think about it. From that allocator's point of view, what they are doing thereby is precisely to give some priority to people who, from their point of view and so far as they know, have a higher risk than the others of needing the liver lobe. Sorry, a higher risk of dying without the liver lobe. So from their point of view, from the allocator's viewpoint, the distribution of chance, if that's how we interpret chance, is actually more egalitarian if they do prioritize those cases of which they know. That seems um, odd, and it makes me think that the allocator's point of view isn't uh, an appropriate standard for the currency of justice. So fairness considerations don't apply to chance, even when chance is um, understood in terms of the subjectivity of the allocator. So my conclusion is that fair chances, and as much as it was appealing when we started, actually is not sustainable on either interpretation of chance. So it's not the case that the distribution of good or bad outcomes is directly a part of fairness. That still leaves open the possibility for, that for a variety of pragmatic reasons, in many cases, not I think in all cases, in many cases we will continue to use lotteries. We could discuss some um, pragmatic reasons to use them during the questions. But the point is that these lotteries remain only instrumental to fighting bad outcomes with all these pragmatic stories. Fundamentally, chance distribution is not itself a proper object for fairness considerations. Thank you.